Okay, so we'll start the session now. Sounds good to everybody. All right. So for all the people who've joined, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. I'm Basta Vartarajan and I work with Kalpavriksh Environment Action Group and I help in the facilitation of the Vikalp Sangam. So I'll give a bigger bit of a background for the South Asia Bioregionism Working Group. So in 2019, Vikalp Sangam held one of its um, thematic confluences, a democracy Sangam in MKSS, where they discussed the kind of problems we're facing in today's democracy. And through that conversation, they thought that it was also important to challenge the way we saw borders and discuss on how we needed to reimagine boundaries beyond um, an anthrop anthropocentric lens, which also takes into account governance and democracies of our ecologies and our social realities. And uh, people and communities have imagined boundaries beyond just the human perspective, encapsulating nature and its thresholds and boundaries too. The current nation state and political boundaries also cut across natural contiguous um, uh, boundaries. And uh, so this group began with an intention to understand how bioregionism served as an alternative to looking at boundaries simply in this anthropocentric way and move beyond the colonial idea of boundaries and to decolonize the way we look at um, like social, the way we look at the way boundaries are defined. And uh, many of the bound, many communities and people have who have been stewarding boundaries have also been looking at boundaries beyond just the understanding of like this being a political border that cuts across, rather looking at the like looking at the way boundaries are working uh, in an ecological sense also and a social sense too. We have through this group been uh, conversing with people around the globe who have been looking at the way bioregionalisms have been practiced. And this group's intention has been to unpack the term and build dialogues around this term bioregionalism and its possibilities in the global south. And uh, they've also been researching possibilities of bioregionalism in the global south, which brings us to today's report. Um, today's session, which is on coastal bioregions to understand the coastal geomorphology and the oceans around it. In this new report that was released called Webbing a Net, Envisioning Bioregions for Coastal India and Adjacent Oceans. Um, this report was, this research was conducted by John Korean, Nandakumar D and Nalini Nayak, whose introduction will be shared shortly. Before we go into the session and introduce our moderator and speakers, I thought it would be good to take a first look at the report. So I'll just be going through the report right now. So, sorry. Just one second, I'll be just sharing the report shortly. Are you guys able to see my report or is it not opening? It's showing a black screen. Okay, just one second. Let me open the report once more then. Yeah, so I'll be able to share the report now. Are you guys able to see the report? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So just a quick look into the report. Um, so this is the report, as I mentioned, it's called Webbing a New Net, Envisioning Bioregions for the Coastal Area of India and Adjacent Oceans. Um, this has been released on our on the South Asia Bioregions and Working Group on Vikalp Sangam's website, which we'll be showing shortly. For, to, for you guys to see where you can access it, we'll be sharing links on our chat bar. I'm just going through it one time so that people can see what it looks like. And uh, yeah. So I'll just, now I'll just shortly introduce our moderator for the session. Um, we're joined by Ashish Kothari, who is an environmentalist, researcher, and author of Alternative Futures and editor of Pluriverse. He is the founder member of Kalpavriksh Environment Action Group and has been a key part of ideating Vikalp Sangam Network and Global Tapestry of Alternatives. He's also been key in forming and the genesis of the South Asia Bioregionism Working Group, 
And without any further ado, I welcome Ashish to take on the platform. Thank you, Vasudha. Um, thanks. Uh, it was very, very exciting, um, especially for somebody like me who knows virtually nothing about coastal and marine ecosystems. Um, it's also, uh, we should also mention, by the way, that that beautifully designed report, uh, we have Vani Garg with us, who's actually done the design. So a uh, great appreciation to her also, apart, of course, from the authors. Um, yeah, I'm going to just uh, very quickly introduce the three uh, speakers and uh, say maybe a line or two about the importance of this report and then hand it over to them. So we have um, three wonderful people. Introducing them in about half a minute each is a bit like seeing a 10 second glimpse of the sea and then not being able to see it again. Uh, but um, that's, you know, we have shortage of time, so I'm just doing it briefly. But there is also a more detailed bio in the chat and also in the in the report that you'll find. Let me start with Nalini. Nalini is uh, it's been a community organizer, trainer, researcher for over five decades, especially on coastal and marine issues working with and also doing participatory research uh, with fishing communities and other coastal communities in Asia and in Africa. And uh, is also a founder member of the, uh, the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers, one of the most important global groups that uh, advocates the rights of fish workers and uh, marine conservation and so on. And currently also a member of the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA. Um, <clears throat> the second... Uh, Sitting next to her right now on the screen is uh, Nanda Kumar. Nanda Kumar is an adjunct professor um, of geography at the Sri Sankaracharya University of Sanskrit. Um, he's been very active with the National Fish Workers Forum. Actually, all three of them have. Uh, and one of his uh, most, uh, I think, well-known reports was on the violations of the coastal regulations on the CRZ uh, notifications and, and law uh, in many parts of uh, southern India on the coast. He's currently, uh, he has actually been, he is a founder member of uh, something called the Initiatives for Ecosystem-Based Livelihoods Enhancement, uh, based in Kerala. And third, we have John, John Korean. John has been a professor, former professor of the Azim Premji University, uh, also has about, uh, you know, more than five decades of doing some incredible research on uh, coastal issues, fisheries issues, helping also with organizing activities uh, with and on the fishery sector, especially the laboring uh, class uh, in the fishery sector and uh, asking very sharp questions about the models of fisheries development that we've had in India over the last few decades. So that's the three of them. It's a wonderful panel. Um, for me in particular, and I think for the whole South Asia Working Group and all the organizations associated with it, this is a very special report for many reasons. One of them is that many of us tend to focus uh, on terrestrial ecosystems. When we think of environment, when we think of uh, uh, wildlife, we think of even bioregionalism, we tend to think of, uh, of the, of the land-based land areas, of forests, of mountains, uh, and so on, and ignore, in fact, what is the vast majority of the Earth's surface, which is the oceans and the seas. And in that sense, actually, our view of bioregionalism, our view of environment, our view of human rights, uh, our view of issues of livelihoods, of development, etc., remains a bit uh, constrained. And I think in that sense, this report actually helps us to break a lot of new ground. Apologies for having to use that. Maybe break a lot of new, I don't know, waves. What does one say in marine context? Uh, and uh, imagine the Earth as a whole. I even think of the fact that, uh, I don't know why, many of us are called greens. Maybe we should also be called blues, you know, uh, greens, because it all everything focuses on forests, which is, of course, a wonderful ecosystem, but it's not the only one on Earth. So uh, in this sense, and also to be able to uh, give us a sense of what are the sorts of interconnections in the South Asian region, South and Southeast Asian region, where the sea or the oceans are actually connecting us. And what does that mean in ecological terms? What, it is, what does it mean in, in livelihoods terms? What does it mean for fishing communities who don't necessarily uh, do their or practice their livelihoods or base their knowledge systems on national or nation state boundaries that cut the oceans in many different ways? So this and for many other reasons, I think this is a very, very interesting, very exciting uh, report for all of us. And I'm very happy to be able to open up this uh, session for our three wonderful speakers. And then uh, I think there'll be... Uh, they have about 30, 35 minutes for presenting the report and their observations, and then we'll open it up for a, for a discussion with all of you. 
So that's it from me. Um, Nalini, Nandan, John, please go ahead in whichever way and whichever order you want. Thank you. Thank you. Ashish. Thank you. Thanks, Ashish and uh, Vasudha as well. Um, yeah, and hello to everybody. I think I'm going to start this presentation. Um, also, because I think we must say that although the three of us are, have been involved in this area for decades, uh, we have also learned a lot in the process as uh, we've had to undo a lot of our original learning and relearn things while, from the people of the coast itself. Uh, so um, Masuda has actually explained what uh, bioregions, I, I mean, I'll kind of, did you change it? Just, Um, I think is the presentation already yeah, it's on? on. Okay. Uh, just one second. You need to share your screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. I, I... Yeah, sorry, just a minute. No problem. In case you're having any trouble, I can share. Ah, I got it. I got it. Does it come? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's how we yes, have yes, titled okay. the presentation. Can everybody see it? Yes, yes, please go ahead. And um, it's called webbing the, a new net. And uh, the, why we, while we say this, you will find out as we go along. Um, our own understanding of bioregions um, is, uh, we've drawn a lot on the work of Peter Berg, but um, bioregionalism is the effort and the social movement striking to redefine and revitalize the geographical spaces, which have common historical, ecological, and social cultural attributes and overlap uh, with a sense of place and community of those who live within that space. So at its core, it is spatially bounded space, which is the region where nature and humans, uh, which is the bio part, interact without necessarily considering or being limited by boundaries of nation states or smaller governance jurisdictions. So as Peter Berg would put it, bioregions are best described by the people who have lived within it. Um, there is a distinct resonance among living things and the factors which influence them um, that occur specifically within each separate place on the planet. Discovering and describing that resonance is a way to describe a bioregion. So we've structured our presentation in this format. I'm not going to read it all. It's all there for you to see. And then when we come, um, to the introduction, which we call a kind of shift of focus. Um, because much as Ashish said earlier, much of the bioregion discussion is land-centered. And here we shift the focus to the fuzzy land-sea interface, which is the coast and the adjacent ocean. So as we call it, the terraqueous realm is commonly called the coastal zone. We know the coast is an edgy place, which confronts um, uh, the adjacent ocean. Uh, tide, tantrum, power, beauty, risk, and the uncertainty of tomorrow. So our attempt is at webbing a new net based on our collective experience of having worked in this zone with coastal people across many countries. And we're making a lot of guesses and seek the thrill of doing so. And we know that all of you with your experience and your questions are gonna help us go further. I'll take it from here. Um, so why the coastal zone is important. Let's, uh, let's look at it this way. There are about 40% of world's population live uh, you know, within 100 kilometers of the coastline. This is what the UN uh, says. But then that's too big a scale uh, to be called coastal zone for our purpose. So let's go by the limits set by the coastal regulation zone 
which is 500 meters. Then we would get about two to two and a half percent of planet surface as coastal zone. But mind you, the population densities in this narrow zone is pretty high. Sometimes even 10,000 people per square kilometer, like the one panchayat here in Jawantra, Anzal, which is not exactly 10,000, a little less, but nearing 10,000. So that's the kind of density we have in this narrow zone. But the coastal zone that we are concerned here is the ocean and a thin strip of land adjacent to the ocean. Normally we say land and then adjacent ocean. We are looking at it from the other way, ocean and the adjacent land. It is that space where terrestrial environment influence marine environment and vice versa. This is an important part of planet surface due to various reasons. The biological productivity, high concentration of nutrients, abundant sunlight, large human populations with many cities, megalopolises, intense economic activities. And also sadly, it's also the zone that would have the first impact due to sea level rise. And being a tail end ecosystem, the zone receives all land-based pollution. Had we not dammed up all the rivers, there would have been a continuous discharge of rich nutrients into the zone, which would have enhanced the married life. But no, we dammed up almost all rivers. Um, have we gone to the second one? Yeah. Next one. Slide seven. Yeah, this one. Um, so we, let, let's talk a little bit about the uh, geomorphology of the coastal area ecosystem. On hearing about coastal zone, the first picture that comes to anyone's mind is based probably um, beach and waves. Uh, well, but that is not all, right? UNESCO's, you know, they, they have this ocean literacy uh, web portal, which says that about 5% of the ocean is explored so far, which means there is more life down there than on the land. Let's therefore include both land and water with its interface, the shoreline, and call it coastal area ecosystem. So we have here the landward realm coast, the seaward realm littoral, and the interface shoreline and coastline. Coast is actually well studied. The landward rim of the coast has many geomorphic features. As you can see in this uh, slide, uh, we have tried to put in some of them. There are beaches. Beaches itself are various kinds, like sandy, pebble, rocky, muddy. Then there are cliffs, promontories, dunes, and so on. But the seaward rim is not visible to us. And it has many geom geomorphic features too like the reefs and you know seagrass beds, shelf, and a whole lot, lot of other features. Each of these formations has its own specific roles in the ecosystem. That's, that's the most important part. A, each of them has an important role. Over time, people have been living and making a living here, and they have evolved specific skills determined by these formations. They hardly made any dent on these formations. Unlike the modern development, which had uh, modified the geomorphology so much that these communities had to adjust in, the, in hard ways. In this own way, this, all these human interactions, that is what it, it changes them. Then the next one we, we would discuss is the littoral zone. Normally in geography, we, uh, for better understanding, we break down the coastal systems into various zones, littoral zone, limnetic zone, benthic zone, et cetera. But our concern here is the littoral zone. This is the area that is close to the shore 
and it goes as far as to the edge of the continental shelf. We have included the intertidal zone also into this zone because estuaries that are found here has an important role to play in the coastal area ecosystem. Then we have the shoreline. That's a very dynamic zone, fussy at times. And they are very dynamic also because of the waves. It dissipates the wave energy. This zone is particularly sensitive to uh, changes over time scales. I don't know uh, how many of you um, have stood at the uh, small zone. If you look at these uh, figures we have given there, there are certain terms which you may want to familiarize. If you're standing at the beach and the wave is coming towards you, wave breaks over your feet in froth and it tickles your feet, etc. Then it tries to drag you along with, with that, uh, the force. And that is called the backwash, which you can see in the uh, figure. Those who have done that, stood there on the beach, feeling the wave, would have also experienced a kind of a slow sinking down feel. That is because you're a new addition to a stable system of that moment. And the zone is trying to accommodate you by squeezing out the interstitial spaces between those grains, triggering a whole gamut of morphodynamic processes to bring the system back to an equilibrium. We'll talk, talk more about that morpho sedimentary responses to the interventions that we have made to this delicate system later. This is an area of this is what we have, our main focus would be, the coastal area ecosystem. This is an area of intense human activity. That means the larger varying forces of nature. The interactions leave actually a signature, often a permanent mark, depending on the kind of interventions we have made. Examples, we can draw about, you know, various uh, interventions that we have made, like for um, aquaculture, we have extensively um, removed the natural vegetation, which is the mangrove forest. And uh, you know there have been two kinds of uh, aquaculture developments. One is extensive and the other is intensive. While in the intensive, we have used a lot of antibiotics and you know, sterilized the land, et cetera, which had, had a very negative impact on the, on the CAE. On the other hand, the other developments, if you if you're uh, aware of this Sagarmala projects and things like that, where you know a series of ports coming to this uh, coastal area, this has a major impact too, because you can see in that uh, the the pictorial one, the schematic one which we have given, you can see the low tide line and the the coastline, and then you have the high tide line. So when you make an intervention, let's say we are constructing a port there, you will be building a, a breakwater. A breakwater would tamper with the whole littoral movement of the, the currents. And it would also uh, you know, lead to uh, huge erosions on one side, accretion on the other. So like that, there will be a lot of, we can draw a lot of examples of how the, you know, these interactions would result in. Now, the most prominent long-standing human residence in this zone is the uh, marine fishing communities. They have seen the brunt of all these development that impacted them. And they are still the one which is taking the brunt of it. So what are the problems that confront the CAE? Well, um, there's degradation, pollution, climate change, overexploitation of land resources. The list would be endless. I don't know that I want to, the time may not permit me to go to each one of these, uh, you know, each one of these human activities. Uh, so I will um, leave the mic to John.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nandan. Uh, what uh, Nandan and Nalini have uh, introduced is uh, very important for what I'm going to now uh, discuss about. Uh, the, the important issue is that, you see, from the geophysical point of view, we have, and from obviously the socioeconomic and ecological point of view, we are approaching a kind of a tipping point. So this is what requires uh, new thinking. And uh, this is what really got us going on this uh, venture. And uh, what we are presenting here from uh, point onwards is how can we envisage uh, bioecological regions for the coastal area and the uh, uh, adjacent uh, ocean? So, you see, as Nandan said, the communities who have been historically and for centuries uh, uh, deeply involved with the coastal zone are the fishing communities, the coastal communities and the fishing communities among them. So, you can imagine a situation where <clears throat> they are in a particular place for this very long time. And so over centuries, they evolve lifestyles, cultures, and they have a very deep understanding of the geomorphology and other dimensions of this uh, coast. So that's at the micro level. At the macro level where we are talking about say the nation state what we what we see is that the um, the nation states have also over time considered various ways by which they can bring about laws and regulations which will encompass uh, different stretches of this uh, uh, marine and uh, land uh, space, particularly the marine space. So, for example, the most recent uh, negotiated uh, agreement is what is called the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. So that is at the national. So what we are trying to do is to think in terms of a new perspective where, which requires not only thinking at the micro level, but also thinking at the global level. So this means it's a bottom up and top down process. So unless we are able to do that, we don't arrive at you know, culturally meaningful and socio-ecologically and uh, economically sustainable uh, terraqueous uh, bioregions. So this is what we uh, plan to do. Uh, next, uh, Nandan. <clears throat> So in the next slide, uh, what we will be talk. what I'm, uh, so this gives you an idea of the three levels that we will be talking about. So I will talk importantly about the micro level, which is the most important uh, level when we come to think about the uh, bioregion perspective. So, here you have communities who have adopted various technologies and as a result, they have uh, gone you know, outward into the sea and horizontally across the space of their village, for example. But because of the limitations of technology, both the outward and the lateral extension of uh, the possibility for them to venture has been limited. So you see, there is a certain boundary, a boundary in the sea, which is uh, uh, due to the limitations of technology. On the land, of course, they have their habitation. And uh, because the habitation is restricted in terms of physical area, you, you have a context where people live together, but they work out at sea. 
Now, this creates its own complexities. And uh, it is necessary for such a situation to create rules and regulations, not only about life on land, but importantly about life in the sea. And this has to do with the kind of technology which will be used or when it will be used and things like that. Also, because of the nature of the technology and the kind of outputs that come from this, I mean, for example, the, the fish that is caught or uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, sedentary species which may be harvested, all these things result in the creation of different social relations in the community, which is importantly land-based. So this will also lead to a division of labor between men and women uh, and, and any, anyone else that is, that is there. Uh, and also it creates you know, the possibility for different kinds of social arrangements on, for example, the boats. So you could have collective ownership, you could have individual ownership. This can change over time. So the, for the most part, what we have observed is that much of this uh, social processes have resulted in very elaborate regimes of management, which are by and large collective. So uh, another next slide. Yeah, so, uh, so this is the important thing that there is a intergenerational historical access that a particular community has had to the sea and the living space on the land. And so what you, what results is that each village, each fishing village can be designated as a rather specific coastal area ecosystem. It composed of land, sea. So there is territory both on land and territory on sea, which of course is not necessarily uh, defined with, uh, uh, with the signposts or lines. So that's what makes this whole process of creating the uh, bioregion interesting and also complex. Now, I've talked about one village, but think of a situation where you have many villages along a coastline. So the, what results is each village is different, but by and large, there are huge similarities between the social processes, the cultural context, the technologies and so on. So while there are similarities, there are huge differences. So we've tried to picture this as a kind of, you know, uh, sizes. So these are uh, uh, coastal area ecosystems of different um, sizes and, and shapes. But what keeps them together? That is the thread which goes through. And this thread is usually a certain uh, um, set of customs. Now, in different countries, uh, the customs can have uh, different manifestations. And I will not get into that. But the important thing is that there are customs which are generally recognized across the, the different uh, um, um, coastal area ecosystems. So this is the point, important point to note uh, in, in uh, the coastal area ecosystem. And as Nandan had has explained, the each ecosystem, each coastal area ecosystem has a landward boundary and a seaward boundary. The seaward boundary is a boundary which we have defined in terms of the depth, which is at 50 meters depth of the ocean. And of course, each uh, um, coastal area ecosystem has a what I call the fuzzy interface, which is the uh, shoreline. Uh, next, uh, Nandan. Yeah, so the 
the while it's easy to portray it in this manner it is not as though there are not problems if we want to regularize this or we want to create a new concept you see because the sea is not homogeneous the depth itself varies across the coastline the and the fact of the matter is that um, much of the sea is unmapped so we we are not able to for example map each of the coastal area ecosystems and because of the highly dynamic nature it becomes difficult you know boundary drawing and other things become uh, difficult also there are huge concerns which we have flagged also uh, earlier that the interface the land and sea interface is prone to natural processes which we call erosion and accretion but these natural processes get exacerbated by different forms of human intervention so these create huge problems as you probably are aware that uh, the big movements which have been building up against the building of ports now uh, those of us who have nothing to do with with fishing will will have no problem in having more ports but every port that comes up destroys a huge uh, section of the coastal area ecosystem of fishing communities so they are up in arms uh, over this then of course climate change climate change will first affect the coastal area so this is a huge uh, issue which we have to take into consideration when we talk about uh, bio uh, uh, regions so the uh, these concerns apart uh, what we need to look at uh, another next slide uh, yeah what we need to look at in order to devise a new regime is to say okay we've said all this but is this just theory or is it actually uh, there as has there evidence of any such uh, coastal area ecosystem which has been there in the past or at least semblance of this which still exists so we have tried to um, indicate in this case at least uh, four such institutions which which exists and which have historical roots which can become the basis for thinking about a new uh, uh bio region for the uh, coast and the uh, marine space so to go through this quickly you have what are called on the east coast the ur panchayat ur refers to village and you have panchayats which are customary panchayats which are very strong which operate um, in a, in a in a manner that gives a certain cohesion to the community it looks into all matters of uh, regarding the occupation and regarding conflicts and uh, other such things and in fact the ur panchayat is actually a, a hierarchical uh, uh, arranged nested you know hierarchical uh, arrangement you have the village uh, above that you have eight villages and then you have a a combination of 8 into 8 64 villages so this is an elaborate scheme which is there and which has been functioning and continues to function of course in a diluted way because with the arrival of the modern panchayat and so on this traditional uh, process has been uh, upset so uh, in kerala you have what is called the kadakodi this is in the malabar coast a similar kind of uh, a institution uh, which is concerned about not over uh, using the resources so they have a very uh, important concept of sufficiency about the use of their resources so you don't need to over exploit you just take what you need for your needs not for the not for greed as uh, gandhi would say so it's so this 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 concept of sufficiency which is important in this particular arrangement which you have in in kerala 
The next is the Koli Panchayat. And I'm sure most of you have heard about the Koli community. Now, this is the, the most important example which still exists because this has a certain historical standing. And since the British used this community uh, hugely, uh, uh, British meaning the, the East India Company, used this community hugely for loading, unloading of their vessels and so on. <clears throat> and therefore, they granted exclusive rights to this community, both on land and at sea. So, for example, if you, in Bombay, the Kohli's, they continue to have rights over some of the costliest uh, real estate on this planet. I mean, you know, the, the coastline of Mumbai. So, this is uh, important to note that these uh, resource, natural resource dependent occupation groups in uh, uh, Mumbai, the, the strength that they have. But importantly, they still do not um, you know, think in terms of speculative private property rights. Their concerns are extremely communitary. So you have that the, the concept of commons and commoning is very strong in these communities. Of course, I'm not trying to romanticize. The commercial pressures have uh, played their role and uh, uh, you know, uh, have uh, taken their toll on these uh, communitarian values. The next is the, uh, the last one we will talk about is the Padu system in uh, the Pulikat Lake on the East Coast. Here also a traditional system which helps people to uh, helps the individuals who are members of the community to make sure that they have access to different uh, realms which have different productivity over time. So this is a, a way of uh, making equitable allocation of uh, bioregions to individuals. And this requires an elaborate uh, governance mechanism and also a mechanism for conflict resolution and uh, uh, other such matters, which uh, we will uh, discuss. Uh, so the next slide. So the lessons for our idea of a coastal area ecosystem that we can draw from these four examples, I'm just highlighting the key lessons. In the case of the Ur Panchayat, we see the possibility for a nested hierarchy of bioregions. The Kadakodi brings in this important concept of sufficiency as a foundation for sustainability of a bioregion. And the Koli Panchayats, they point to the advantage of access to historical records as a basis for claiming commons uh, or retaining commons. And the Padu system, again, highlights the need for strong governance mechanisms uh, for conflict resolutions. So what I've done is to, uh, successfully or not, the, to elaborate on the most important part of this uh, concept of ours, which is at the local level. Now, Nandan will deal very quickly with the, the, the intermediate meso level and the macro level. Now, um, you know, so while we have these uh, traditional arrangements that John just narrated, um, we feel that there is a mismatch between sociology and geography. Um, actually, there's a, there's a need to better understand the larger coastal processes and how local problems are tied to this broader scale sediment pathways, etc. Well, I, may, I mentioned uh, earlier about the, the, what John also said about the fuzzy shoreline which you know, tries to bring to an equilibrium that we need to uh, remember here. You know, so we thought that maybe uh, the concept of sediment cell could help us match this sociology and geography. So it's basically, um, you know, if we go to the next one, this is basically uh, what the NCACM, um, Government of India's Ministry of Environment, they have uh, you know, uh, identified about 27 primary sediment cells. 
and 59 second reasons. That's all there in the map. Well, this could be compared with the landscape mapping of about 35 integrated river basins, you know, disaggregated into 112 catchments and 3,257 3, watershed, etc. You know, that kind of matches that. So, uh, next. So at micro level, we have those traditional institutions. At meso level, we have sediment cells. And at macro level, we have the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles from the coastline. So this, to our, what we think, is an ideal way to delete bioregions. Um, I think Johnny is going to talk. Yeah, so, so you see, uh, very quickly, what we try to do is to show the possibility of a nested arrangement. So in this diagram here, it may look a little complex, but at the lower end, you will see the coastal area ecosystems. So these are many because they are they would be like the villages uh, along the coastline, along a coastline. But a set of villages can be part of one sediment cell. So the sediment cell is actually a, 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 the, the sea-based boundary, you know, where we will not get into the details, but uh, it's the equivalent of uh, the watershed on land. So, so you can have five or six uh, um, uh, coastal area ecosystems for one sediment cell, and you can have several sediment cells. And the sediment cells, in turn, are part of the larger uh, exclusive economic zone, which is part of our uh, the nation's uh, territory. So this is how we have gone about webbing this new net that we say the, uh, that uh, uh, the, there is a possibility of thinking about bioregions which are largely uh, in the sea, but with important land-based uh, uh, dimension. And uh, I, I think um, this is adequate for uh, starting our discussion on. Uh, so if we want to uh, make this into a reality, it's important that, you know, under the constitution, the territory that is up to 12 nautical miles, this is under the jurisdiction of the state. So what we can do is what we need to work with the states that they should come about with some kind of consensus that there is a limit within this 12, which would be say four nautical miles under which you can have the, the coastal uh, local administration uh, bodies, coastal panchayat or whatever, can have jurisdiction over that particular area. Now, at the moment, nobody has jurisdiction over this limited area. And a lot of the problems uh, happen in that limited area. So the, there is the traditional jurisdiction as well as this, the new jurisdiction, which has come as part of the, uh, this uh, possibility of uh, the, the decentralization uh, constitutional uh, change 7374. So <clears throat> a similar uh, amendment we can make to the CRZ notification. CRZ notification, CRZ4 extends up to 12 nautical miles. So we can subdivide this into two parts. We can talk about a littoral regulation zone, which will be up to four nautical miles. And then that can be brought under the uh, governance of the local uh, self-governance units, the panchayats or municipal, coastal municipalities uh, and so on. So this is well within the uh, regulations that we have at the moment. So once we have adequate experience in uh, putting this into practice, then we can push for management and governance of the littoral regulation zone. Uh, but then that would require constitutional amendment because at the moment uh, that's not possible. 
So this is where uh, we need to move. So finally, we are at this, uh, we don't have a conclusion. That's why we call this in lieu of conclusion. So um, Nalini or Nandan, you want to say something about this before we stop? Uh, yeah. Uh, John, just finish. You conclude. Yeah. So, so you know, I, I don't take more than a minute uh, for this. So, you see, the, the the framework that we have presented, it is based on a current reality. Of course, it is still, uh, it's not a reality which is very solid. It is a reality uh, which has a long past and uh, it still continues today in some places. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we can think of that as the edifice for uh, uh, talking about a, a, a future. So it is, it is just this. Uh, the rest of what is written there is more uh, our, you know, loud thinking of how we can create this vision and which I hope uh, we will be able to get some comments uh, from uh, those of you who are uh, listening in uh, about uh, the possibilities that we have uh, put across to you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nalini, John, and Nandan. That was uh, fascinating. I think uh, this is definitely going to generate a lot of discussion. Uh, we already have two or three questions in the chat. I'm going to come back to these in a, in a minute. Uh, I want to kick off the discussion with a couple of questions and, and comments. Uh, maybe I think you could now um, stop sharing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I think one is, uh, well, firstly, I learned a new word today, and I'm grateful for that, terraqueous bioregions. I'm not sure that's pronounced correctly. But that combines terrestrial and uh, aquatic. So that's a wonderful new word that I learned. Um, I think the uh, what you pointed out in terms of the four traditional governance systems, that's really uh, fascinating because we have, some of us have also been studying these traditional pre-Panchayat governance systems in other parts of India, all terrestrial, such as the uh, Goba system in Ladakh and others. And we feel just like you do that there is a lot of current relevance to those traditional systems. They're being ignored, they're being neglected. Many of them have faded out or have become much weaker, uh, including amongst the communities that used to practice them. But uh, they remain extremely relevant and important. So I think in that sense, being able to put together an understanding of these traditional governance systems, both terrestrial and aquatic and marine and then have a kind of a combined vision of how we might want them to be re-recognized, but also recognizing, of course, that many or maybe all of them all, uh, also had uh, their own internal inequalities, gender inequalities, caste, et cetera, um, and how those could be changed. So, that, I mean, that's just a, a, a quick observation on, on what you said. Um, in terms of the uh, possibilities of governance of the kind that you're talking about, uh, what would, uh, would there be something like, say, the Forest Rights Act, which provides for not just every individual village to claim their community forest, but also habitat rights, especially for so-called uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups. And those habitat rights can be very, very large uh, and, and are not necessarily split amongst villages, which recognizing the fact recognizes the fact that traditionally Adivasis, indigenous communities, uh, used to, in fact, and, and still do in some cases, uh, practice their governance over uh, territories which go well beyond their own village boundaries. So I'm wondering whether something like that could be uh, thought of or maybe already was considered um, when there was a proposed law for fishery rights, I think, around the time, uh, I, 10, 15 years back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one sort of quick question. The second one is... I think, John, you said that the micro level, amongst the three levels that you pointed out, the micro, the meso, and the macro, uh, the micro is the most important. And I was a little confused about why. I mean, from the point of view of people, of course, that's what they're seeing face to face. That's their everyday reality. So that I can understand most important. But from a uh, wildlife or biodiversity or uh, non-human perspective, would that be the most important or would the macro, the meso and the macro, and then going beyond the macro into beyond nation state boundaries, of course, uh, would that be in fact the most important where, it, where it's the actual, the 
uh, non-human components of the marine ecosystems are concerned. Uh, so these are a couple of questions um, and a comment, and maybe you can start off with these, and then we'll get to uh, Uma Shankari and Sujit's questions and any more that are coming up. Over to you. Hello. Uh, okay, Ashish, this question on the uh, forest rights issue. I mean, I think from my point of view, I'd always been very envious of the forest rights groups that were able to get their act together and collectively work towards the Forest Rights Act. Um, I think that was a huge thing for this country. Um, we didn't succeed in the fish workers movement. Uh, one, because of the dyna dynamic uh, differences in the coastal zone, but even just getting these groups together was a huge, um, what shall I say, uh, her um, Herculean task. So as I said, it would have been wonderful if 15 or 20 years ago, when the Forest Rights Act was moving in the direction that it did and the groups were mobilized and achieved what they did, it would have been wonderful if in the movements of the fish workers, we could have worked towards something similar. But I know, we, I, I feel, and in fact, last night, while the three of us were talking, we were talking about this, uh, to say, I think that's been a huge, uh, you know, failure or a lacuna in the work that went on in the coastal zones and the movements, because the the demands were on something, uh, you know, the the need to um, conserve the uh, the fish resource per se, you know, and didn't look at this more macro dimension of how the human um, nature interface was so important in sustaining. Uh, the traditional institutions, which kept the ecosystem sustained. So I would say that much for now. Um, and uh, when you say, why is the micro important? Uh, my feedback would be, John and Nandan may have their own positions. You know, in my understanding, the ecosystems also in the, in the coastal zone, in a way, are micro. If you look at it from that point of view, you know the the way the fish operate, the way, and then they move out. But all their nursery grounds, their areas, the it's in a smaller area, which the people understand very well, communities understand very well. And then, of course, when they are when they have grown, they go out. But even there, they have their habitat areas, which of course you don't see because it all looks like big ocean. But under the water, there's the forest, there's the hills, there's the rocks, there's the sand and everything. So it's another world down there, you know. But another may have an, you know, add to that. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, we are all aware of this large marine ecosystems, yeah. LMEs, which, um, you know, it, is a larger uh, area, which probably uh, from a um, a bioregional perspective would be ideal to you know going beyond that uh, micro and meso. But then I think uh, when we take um, the sediment cell as the meso, uh, we are actually uh, taking part of that larger ecosystem as well. So earlier I mentioned about why there is this mismatch between sociology and Geography. One of the reasons is that throughout the, you know, how the um, the the seaward part of the uh, system molded the skills that have developed in the in fishing communities. Like, for example, if you look at the shore scene, the shore scene has evolved in areas where there is sandy beaches, where the continental shelf is you know, conducive for that kind of fishing. And, you know, like that, each system had exerted its influence to the community and vice versa. So probably, you know, that is what we were trying to identify. At a micro level, when we are not including the seaward component, there is this mismatch. While, it, while historically that is what has been happening. The traditional communities did have that, but that has been 
severed by the modern web development. I don't know whether I am uh, answering your question, but Johnny may be able to uh, give you a better answer then. So I, I don't have a better answer, but uh, I, I, I think you see this is this has been recognized. This uh, the link between the micro and the little more macro in the sea. Now you see there is a, a famous uh, treatise called the ethno ethno eth ethnological significance of Indian boat design. Now you know, a strange combination of, of uh, in a title. That is a, a, a work which is talking about how along the coast of India, you have such a huge diversity of technology, which matches with the geophysical part of the ocean of that particular space, but is also influenced by, you know, socio-cultural uh, impacts that have taken place in that region. Uh, I, I don't want to elaborate, it's, it's too... Uh, so, uh, this is probably what we were trying to grapple with, that the sediment cell is a slightly larger uh, realm of biodiversity in the ocean, within which you have this land and sea-based, uh, you know, coastal area ecosystems, or the villages, where the people are, you know. So, and you, you, you will notice that within a sediment cell, there are similarities in socio-cultural aspects, in technology, and so on and so forth. Of course, it is not that these remain cut in stone. These are changing, obviously, with the with development processes, the homogenization of technology has resulted in a lot of this being uh, demolished. Uh, so, but if we are to go back to bioregion, we have to also go back to uh, technological diversity. Because you know th those were developed on the basis of the resource and the the fluid dynamics in the sea. So so that is why I'm, we are not saying that micro is the most important. Of course, because of the people perspective, it is the most important. But if you take the example of the coolies, I mean, what they have is is basically a traditional right. I mean, the equivalent of a forest right, because they have rights on land and they have also their rights uh, uh, in the sea, which are very well protected. And they, they protect it, uh, you know, very, uh, very jealously. So there, whether you can expand this to the whole of India, is a, that's a different uh, issue. But there are possibilities and we need to go back into the historical dimensions to look at uh, the possibilities for the future. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Nalini, Nandan, and John. So I'm going to, yeah, uh, there's a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to ask if the people who are asking questions can unmute and ask the question yourself. It gives us a bit of diversity of voices here. Uma Shankari, would you like to, I don't know if technically that's possible. That is possible. The, uh, to, they just have to raise their hands if they're uh, like there and then we'll um, unmute them. Yeah, like Uma Shankari has, yeah. Umaji, go ahead. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so I was wondering why ports are not good for fishing because we've always had ports in history and uh, a thriving tra sea trade throughout history. And uh, they must, are they in different, uh, I mean, the fishing happens in different areas from ports? I'm just wondering, like say uh, the Coromandel Coast uh, uh, seems to have had both fishing communities and trading, sea trading communities. Uh, that's one question. Uh, second question was this, uh, as you were saying, sediment cells, what is the function uh, of that? And you explained uh, some of it and uh, maybe you can do. And I was also wondering the younger generation on, in the fishing communities, now they have started going to schools and other things, colleges and all that, the modern education. Uh, have they continued, uh, you know, their fishing traditions and do they understand? Do they want, how do they want to 
uh, you know, continue this because this is such an important occupational category. Uh, now that we have such a long, huge coastline, and it's so important to keep this uh, tradition going. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Maji. Uh, do schools, uh, modern schools, match up with the schools of fish or not? That's the question. Uh, so, which one of you would like to answer these two or three questions? Um, I, I'll go for that uh, the sediment cell which uh, uh, Uma had asked. Okay, then I'll do the... Um... Yeah, the first one, the uh, ports. Okay, I'll start with the ports. Um, it's true that there's always been, had old long trade in fish and the fish was one of the, you know, earliest internationalized kind of industry. That's right. You're completely right about that, Umaji. Uh, but um, I think that happened from very traditional ports themselves, um, where, you know, the coastline was given to uh, this kind of larger fishing vessel, which could carry fish. So that was fish trade, but that is not actually what fishing per se was about. So even where you had these ports, which did export uh, fish and a lot of dry fish before you came into the ice age, uh, refrigerator age, uh, it was all salted and dried. And so this was a fish that was collected from big landing centers uh, where the uh, most of the craft were beach landing craft. So, uh, so the coast, and as we were speaking earlier, we had varieties of beach landing crafts of all sizes, and some of them which came into these natural harbors. Now, when you speak about a fishing port, and the reason why now we are saying fishing ports actually displace a lot of fishers themselves, it's because at, at very rapidly, many of the um, the natural harbors or the natural fishing areas are being converted into commercial ports. So those were fishing grounds and which have, which are these natural fishing ports are surrounded by very rich fishing grounds. So when you begin to deepen the seabed to make, a, make it uh, possible for bigger ships to come in and ports to come in, you destroy entirely the seabed. It's like cutting off an entire forest landmass so that you see no wildlife there anymore. It's exactly what happens here. And so you destroy the entire habitat of the fish and the underwater life where, um, you know, which has developed over generations and you lose that entire fishing ground. And that's what's happening rapidly in our country today. Um. <clears throat> Uh, now about the sediment cells, you know, you asked about the morphology of the sediment cells. Um, this uh, actually, the concept of sediment cell was, you know, developed in UK. It's meant for, you know, calmer, temperate waters. But that doesn't mean that we cannot apply it here, um, at least for the sake of, you know, planning and, you know, delineation of regions. Yes, it is possible. If you have two um, geomorphic features that jets out into the sea, that area between these two um, features natural. would become a natural uh, trap for the sediment. So sediment movement is a very natural thing. It happens all over the coast. We have longshore currents which transport uh, sediments. And then we have also the littoral currents which are closer to the shore. What happens in these areas, these smaller currents, the closer to the uh, land currents would be uh, transporting the sediments depending on, you know, on way it changes from season to season. Let's say for during the monsoon, before the Southwest monsoon starts, you will find that the, the sand, which is, you know, brought by these uh, littoral currents would stack it up on the edge of the continental shelf which actually acts like a buffer for the larger waves. So during the monsoon, when huge waves, you know, come thrashing onto our coast, this actually is a buffer. This is what the natural way it used to be. But when, uh, you know, large developments like, you know, big ports with huge, you know, running two kilometers into the sea kind of uh, breakwaters are built, 
this process uh, hampered with. But the sediment cell, because it has two natural things in it, there is already a, uh, an area where it traps this thing. So it basically encompasses, the sediment cell is also not just between promontories, but then it's also, you know, you have intertidal areas can be a sediment trap area, which is a sediment cell. So it kind of relates to the sediment. That is also why it is called a sediment cell. Actually, it is also called a littoral cell. In geography, you call it littoral cell as well. But um, for the sake of our uh, delegations, we thought that, you know, using the word sediment cell. Thank you, Nalini and Nandan. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions from Sujit. Sujit, would you like to raise your hand? And uh, Sorry, John, did you want to also respond to that? Maybe uh, in response to Sujit, you can add anything more you want. To generation. I think Sujit, we, uh, are you able to... Sorry, sorry Ashish. Uh, Umaji had asked about the younger generation. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. That, uh, John... I, I would like to take up uh, some of the other questions because, I mean, like uh, Sujit, uh, Sujit raised so the question. Nalini, about, do you want to respond to that uh, on youth? Uh, on, sorry, John, so on the youth, do you want to take that up, Nalini or Nandan? Well, you know, there are two sides to this. Um, there are lots of young people, of course, you know, since fishing and life at sea is difficult and you have to learn it from childhood if you want to know the ocean as well as your parents knew it, you have to start very young. And in today's school system, if you have to be in school from eight to five, you don't know, you don't get to learn about the sea. So that's one thing where the traditional skills uh, that were used earlier, you can't learn them with our schooling system today. But with technology, it facilitates young people to go back to the to see because technology provides you uh, some of these skills that you would otherwise learn uh, traditionally and in, in, inherit from your parents. So you would notice that there are lots of young people who have studied uh, who go back to fish, but they use modern technology to go back to fish. Mm, and you would have a lot of people today who uh, also realize um, what kind of technology uh, would help them and what kind of technology also drains them of all their resources. So there are people who understand that, you know, with all the additional technology, which is very expensive, uh, you normally don't, you won't get your returns uh, to the extent that you've spent all this money in putting it in unless you get big loans. So there are groups of people who go back to uh, much smaller boats, simple technology, and you even see that happening. And they are educated people, they've all gone to school. So there are differences occurring everywhere along the coast, but I don't think we have any significant data to share with you, unless John has some. You know, I, I have no, no data, but uh, I just want to uh, reiterate that Yes, it is true that a lot of young people from fishing communities have gone out of it, but uh, many uh, are coming back. I mean, for example, again, I'm talking about uh, the Kohli community. You will see that there are so many young people who are, you know, who, who control the, the fishing. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, it is important that if we bring in also this dimension of greater management of the resource and convert, reconvert this back into a community common property rather than, in, than the open access that it is, then communities and younger people will certainly, uh, you know, come back and play a bigger role in this. This is what I feel. And also from uh, our concrete experience of working in fishing villages, we can say this. So that's just about, <coughs> about youth. Um, thanks. Um, thanks. Sorry, I dropped off uh, for half a, half a minute. Um, Sujit, over to you. And if everybody uh, could be very quick now, because we still have about five, six more questions and about 15 minutes left. Sujit? 
can you hear me yes yeah so since john had mentioned that uh, panchayat where eight fishing villages have a governance structure at 64 so i was just wondering whether in any state of india when they were making the gram panchayat boundaries did they adhere to this traditional system or if they have done it in other countries and whether we can learn yeah. something from it yeah uh, thank you sujith nice to see you here um the uh, no the answer is no to the first part of your question uh but uh, you know for example uh, post tsunami for example you know the delivery of uh, aid was done most successfully through the ur panchayats so uh, suddenly they got a recognition that you know if you want to get something done you it's much better to go through the customary systems because all said and done they are much more just and inclusive they may be hierarchical they may be uh, non gender friendly and all that but uh, you know when it comes to issues of the community they are much more uh, keyed in on the issue of justice and inclusion which i think is grossly missing and which is one of the reasons why we have gone on this this uh, uh, wrong path so that is uh, to be said about the indian context of course uh, uh, the situation with the stronger uh, communities like kolis and so on is again uh, to be seen that you know that uh, in uh, southeast asian countries that there are many examples in indonesia also for example there is a 400 year old uh, fisher organization customary organization called the panglima laut which is based on this cea principle land and water so it is a socio ecological unit of land and water uh, ecological unit of land and water which is given to a community which lives on that particular realm of land and they have customary regulations so actually this necklace idea comes from there uh, so in in archipelago states the there is much greater overlap between the customary institutions and the modern institutions ours being a continental country where you know fishing is not so important and so on it's natural that uh, we we would tend to and given the caste uh, structure it's uh, natural that uh, we don't give such priority to uh, uh, coastal communities and uh, you know people who belong to the lower echelons of the caste hierarchy but in uh, countries like cambodia buddhist cambodia muslim uh, indonesia where these features that we have so strong here don't operate so much there is you see very obviously a greater possibility for revival of many of these uh, traditional uh, customary institutions thank you john um marlin would you like to ask your question yes please go ahead man um i'm assuming i'm audible yes we can hear you yes uh so i mean it probably sound is a naive question but the proposition of a coastal area ecosystem sounds more like a closed system wherein you have a, a micro meso and a macro level and that is how the only three factors how you are viewing this particular system but in cases of where there is livelihood diversification the system no longer is closed and it is so how do you factor in those things wherein if you're farming or you're dependent on forestry now how does this system alter yeah um, may i start <clears throat> yeah you, you know you're right uh, coastal area is not only uh, habited by fishers but <clears throat> in a in, when the moment you bring in the sea into the coastal area then you know the the community on which you have to anchor any bio uh, region would have would be the fishing community that does not mean that uh, they exclude the others so you know we you can you can expand this whole concept and talk in terms of uh, not uh, uh, fishers but you can talk in terms of 
uh, ocean citizens, um, people who depend on the ocean. So it could be people who are in the tourist trade within a local, uh, um, you know, coastal area ecosystem. So they could also be part of this. It is important for them to keep the, the sea clean. It is important for them to preserve biodiversity because, you know, this will attract more tourists. So you, you can bring in other, other uh, uh, working uh, groups into this concept. But all that we are trying to say is that because you are dealing with a historical process, it's, it would be uh, useful to start with the, the fishing community. I'm just reminded of the famous uh, march of the uh, National Fish Worker Forum, uh, which was called the Kanyakumari March, where they had the theme, protect water, protect life. So this is an example of a, a fishing trade union taking the initiative to unite people who are concerned about water. So you see all along the coast, I mean, anyone who lives on the coast, uh, is concerned about water, not necessarily from the sea. So uh, th this is the way in which one can go about it. We have to uh, expand the, the base of the laboring communities and working uh, groups in a coastal area ecosystem and get them to participate in ensuring that the land and the sea are protected. If I may, I have a follow-up to that. Um, Merlin, sorry, my apologies. Oh, okay, we okay. still have uh, other people no, who asked. So if we have time, then uh, we'll come back to you. Um, so uh, also, Nanda, Nalini or John, in, if any of you can answer, uh, there are a bunch of questions from Ajay Kumar, which are more factual. You could probably answer them, uh, type them out in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, Siddharth Chakravarti, would you like to quickly ask your question? Marlin, you can also put your follow-up question in the chat and maybe they can respond uh, by typing it out. Yeah, Siddharth, go ahead. Hi, hi. Sorry, I... Uh, thanks for the report, John, Nalini, and Nandan. Uh, the question was really... It said it all. This is motivated by the fact that I am in Andhra Pradesh at the moment. And just thinking about coastal aquaculture and kind of doing some research with shrimp, just kind of thinking about the longer histories of agricultural development and its impact on the coastline and on fishers. But I think John's comment on the last question really responded a lot to my question about the anchoring of ocean citizens or fisher people. So I think that's answered. I have nothing further to ask, but thank you for that. But the question was largely to think about how there's also longer histories of agriculture, which kind of have got enmeshed with the coastline and how we think about it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Your, thanks. Thanks a lot, Siddharth. Yeah, okay. Um, Nikhil Sharma, go ahead, please. This might be the last one. If Ajay's questions can be answered on chat, that'll be wonderful. Uh, Nikhil, please. Nikhil, you'll have to unmute. Hi, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my question is more about the local governance that uh, the the report tries to put in place. So, uh, like even with uh, looking at the terrestrial thing, uh, we have local governance, like panchayats in in land. So, uh, but they still remain largely uninformed and incentivized there is uh, external factors like political pressures on deci decision making and then there are internal issues as well so how do we navigate them uh, in term in in the case of coastal areas because that remains the issue in uh, remains the issue in uh, the plains as well so. well uh, nikhil are you my former student uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Nikhil. Yeah, I mean, this is this is true. I mean, uh, you know, these are issues that we have to we will have to tackle once we we you know get the basic concept going. Now, you know, resource mobilization is a, a matter, uh, and if you if you you know if you look at the amount the wealth that there is in in uh, coastal fishing. 
uh, you will be amazed uh, what kind of resources are available there. You see, in the village where, where Nalini and myself started our work, the, the collection for the church, which is supposed to be 5% of the earnings of the community, was auctioned for one crore, one lakh. So that's just <laughs> you know, 5%. So you, you can see the amount of uh, wealth that can be generated if you have the proper systems. So it's not that there is no money. That's not the issue. The issue is that we don't have the proper systems to, to, to collect that money, to absorb it, and to utilize it in the way that needs to be utilized. Of course, things like uh, political pressure, decision making, all these things are there, uh, which are valid. And I don't think we have a, an answer to that. But uh, we have to start somewhere. Okay. Thanks. Um, we uh, we are about two minutes uh, from closing time. We can go on another five minutes, if that's okay with the three of you. Um, so I, um, I don't know. Uh, from Ajay, as I said, there are a number of things which are actually factual, but maybe there's one thing that you could respond to, which is about the British, uh, the Kohli community was given special rights by the British in Mumbai. What other legal rights changes were made by the British rule uh, or what might still exist? Any of you want to take that on? Sorry, just, just repeat the last part. I can't see the question. Yeah, he says the, um, the Kohli community was given special rights by the British in Mumbai, which you also mentioned. What other legal rights changes were made by the British rule in relation to, I guess, fishing communities? And do any of those rights still exist? I'm just adding that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, the British tried to introduce lots of technology and so on. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, uh, they, they certainly, this report which I mentioned about this uh, James Hornell's uh, documentation of the uh, the the boats uh, so some of uh, what they have done is is really uh, uh, very important but i don't think uh, there is anything much to say in terms of uh, granting of rights and so on this was the kohli community is very specific because uh, of the relationship that the east india company uh, and the dependence that they had on the coolies for uh, you know loading and unloading of the merchandise so it is very specific to that uh, for example in in uh, in chennai also they depended on the katamaran fishermen but they didn't give them any particular rights i mean they uh, so um, that's the only way i can give you an answer i don't know nali and uh, uh, no, I think that um, it's very pertinent to ask such a question now, because for those who live around Bombay also know that there's this big coastal highway that's coming up, which is going to intrude the Kohli land. And the Kohli's are putting up a big fight about it uh, because they have these documents. So, but how far they'll succeed, we don't know. Uh, so the point is that in Maharashtra and closer to Mumbai, it's not only the Kohli lands, but there were several markets which were allocated for fishing, which belonged to women. And those markets were, uh, you know, they have documents to say these locations were specifically for markets for fish. But even those now are being, you know, the they're being intruded on by the by the government and corporations. So safeguarding those spaces is going to be very difficult. Um, although those rights exist and they have documents and the communities are quite united on them. But I don't know for how long they can hold on to it. I might just add that you know, there, are, there are many communities who are today going about mapping their uh, historical you know, use rights on, on the beach and, uh, and the coast. And, uh, you know, with proper GIS, uh, uh, you know, location, this, that, and so on and so forth, and providing maps to the uh, municipalities and so on, and uh, also challenging many of these things in court. So uh, this is an interesting uh, development. 
and that it that the initiative comes from the youth of the community not from outsiders so the youth of the community are are becoming aware one of the the huge uh, you know the the monetary value of the land on which they are sitting so i mean that alone uh, is enough uh, motivation to get them working on some of these things so 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 they are also trying to you know uh, uh, bang at the uh, the uh, the the context uh, against which uh, they are uh, fighting thanks and actually we haven't got into it but i think the un recent un uh, declaration also on the rights of peasants and small fisher fisher communities and all i don't know if that's also uh, of some use perhaps it might be useful if people go to court because india is signatory to many of yes, them yes. are supposed to be yeah. uh, adhering to them so um but yeah i mean i think this has been fascinating i'm sorry there's a number of uh, ajay ji and marlin and and hemant we've just put the email ids of our three speakers in the chat uh, if you could maybe follow up with your questions directly to them because we are um, we are out of time i uh, i think if we i mean others i don't want to add any concluding remarks because i'm way out of depth uh, in this but uh, i think uh, there's obviously a lot more work that needs to be done you already laid a wonderful uh, foundation for uh, for this work it's as i said it's uh, way of breaking and uh, so we need to figure out i think uh, how maybe the bioregionalism working group and others who are in this session if anybody would like to add to help strengthen the report take this further do anything with it including i think taking it to fishing communities coastal communities in local languages uh, get their perspectives into this and maybe the three of you are also planning something like that and anything else that anybody can think of i think the more we can spread this kind of thing especially amongst the terrestrial populations of india who know so little about uh, marine and coastal ecosystems and in the governing institutions the the sort of uh, institutions of corridors of power Uh, for people to be able to listen to these sorts of issues i think that would be wonderful so with that uh, i'd like to thank the three of you this has really been wonderful and we hope we can have many more such interactions uh, on on the issues that you've written about spoken about and worked on for so many decades back to you uh, vasudha namrata who's closing yeah i think you did a pretty good job at like closing the session all together and like once again thank you all of you this was sorry there's some background in my uh, there might be some noise in my background but like i just want to thank all of you for coming out to the session and for this and it was a really really engaging session so i wanted to thank the attendees also for being so active and asking so many questions we have given links to all their email ids on our chat bar and we've also given um links to our previous sessions and where you can access the report um and thank you everybody for coming on and with that i think we can conclude the session namrata anyone wants to make any last comments namrata including you well just okay. if people want to connect with us they can write to the bioregionalism email okay. and thanks vasudha and namrata for your background work on this uh, thanks everybody thank you thank you thank everybody so thank you thanks to all